Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to my Adventures in Pure Mathematics series. Today, I want to give a brief introduction to the topic of modules and basically give an indication of why they're so important in mathematics. So, to start off with, it's good to realize that modules are something which generalize something that's probably very familiar to you, the notion of a vector space. So we'll start by recalling the definition of a vector space. So what do we need? We need firstly a field of scalars, which we denote by R. And then what's a vector space? Well, it has two operations. It has an addition, denoted with plus, and that gives you an abelian group structure M. So that's denoted M plus. And it also has a scalar multiplication map. We can write it like this, uh, map mu from the cross product R cross M to M. And the usual way we write it, we don't write it out as the function notation. We write the image of R comma M as just R times M. And of course, this has to satisfy certain axioms. So of course, there's some axioms already in assuming that this is a group. And the other axioms involve the scalar multiplication. So you want multiplying by one to be our identity. You also want scalar multiplication to be associative. And you also want the distributive law to hold. So this tells you how the addition and the scalar multiplication are compatible with each other. Now one of the things to realize in this definition is that actually nowhere in the definition do you really need to have the full force of the axioms of a field. In fact, you could just replace this with any ring of scalars. Indeed, you didn't really need to know that the multiplication inside the field was commutative. This definition still makes complete sense. Also, you didn't need to know that every non-zero element inside this uh, ring of scalars has an inverse. So that gives us the definition now of what a module over R is. So a module over R, it's essentially a vector space over R. So it's just an abelian group with a scalar multiplication such that the usual axioms hold. Multiplication by one is identity, scalar multiplication is associative, and the distributive law holds. So why are we interested in studying modules? Well, there are many, many answers to this question. But one of the reasons why they crop up is when we're trying to solve matrix equations. So let's look at a very simple example. Let's pose the question, let's solve xy equals minus yx, which is the same as xy plus yx equals zero. But of course, not for scalars. You can't solve this. Easy. <laughs> for scalars in an interesting way, but rather for matrices x and y, where matrix, the matrices x and y are square, let's say n by n. Now these types of equations, they occur very often in physics, in particular if you look at quantum mechanics. And what I want to show you now is that solving matrix equations naturally gives us uh, modules and leads us to the theory of modules. Okay, so let's see how that works. Okay, so firstly, we need a ring of scalars. So what's our ring of scalars? Well, we're going to start with this ring CXY, and this is going to be the ring of non-commutative polynomials in X and Y. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, basically, I mean linear combinations of products of the X and Y, like 3 plus X plus 5Y plus Y cubed plus XY minus 2YX. And the only difference from the usual polynomials, is that the multiplication is not commutative, so that xy doesn't equal yx, and so you can't simplify this term here to minus yx. Well, it's quite easy to work out how this is a ring, and the ring we want to look at is not this one here, but rather a quotient of this ring of non-commutative polynomials. Let's see xy and we're going to quotient out by the ideal generated by xy plus yx. So we're going to let i 
equal the ideal generated by xy plus yx. And how does module theory over this ring arise when studying a problem like this one here? Well, let's look at the following fact. Suppose you actually have a solution to this. Well, then I claim that you actually get an R module, a module over R, M, and as an abelian group, it looks like C to the N. So that gives the abelian group structure the addition, and I just have to tell you what the scalar multiplication is. And here, you also know how to multiply by elements of C because this is a vector space over C. So the only things I need to tell you are how to multiply by the coset containing X and the coset containing Y. And this is where the solution comes in. In this case here, the coset containing X, left multiplication by that, is just left multiplication by the matrix big X, which solves this equation. I hope you can guess, of course, that means that the scalar multiplication by the coset containing Y is just left multiplication by this Y. So these V's are inside CN, and these X's and Y's, remember, were N by N matrices, so this product gives you something that's still a length N vector. And this, it's easy to check, defines a module over this ring R. So why is that true? So what's the key computation to check that this is true? It's the following one here. Let's suppose you look at this ideal, and remember it's generated by xy plus yx. And we need to see what, how does this act on any vector v? Well, of course, this, when you expand it out, can be written as the product like this, x plus i times y plus i times v plus y plus i times x plus i times v. But this is also just the ideal because i is generated by this. So that's the zero inside the ring. So this has to equal zero. Okay. Well, let's look on this side. What does that equal? Well, left multiplication by y plus i is just left multiplication by big Y. Then you have to left multiply by x plus i, which is left multiplication by big X. And similarly for this term here, you get the same thing, but you've swapped the x and the y around. We need the answer to be zero. Now, fortunately, you can use the distributive law. And the fact that this is equal to zero, since it it's a solution to this equation star, the matrix equation we were looking at, to show that this is zero. So there's no contradiction here. And what's really nice this, uh, about this is that actually this whole argument reverses. So if you're given an R module, and it's, it reverses most easily when you think about it in terms of a finite dimensional one over C, if it's finite dimensional, R module M, you can identify it with Cn for some n by picking a basis. And then you get a solution to this equation just by looking at left multiplication by the coset containing x. That gives you your big X. And left multiplication by y plus i, that gives you your big y. And that gives you a solution to that equation. So how can we sum up what's happening here? Essentially, solving this matrix equation corresponds to looking at modules over this ring here. Where does the equation come in? I hope you can see how the equation comes in. It tells you what you should factor this ring by. So the equation itself corresponds to the ring. And what about the module? For each solution to this equation, you get a module. So essentially, you can think of modules as just solutions to matrix equations. 